When you're planning out your investments and looking over a long time, how do you factor in the price action into that? Is it just based off the price action? Do you look at news that's going on? Um, there's obviously lots of news that can swirl around any investment that could drive that. But is that more long term or short term? Well, today I am joined with Charles Edwards, who's somebody who has managed to be able to put those two things together, taking the fundamental news and then factoring it into the short term price action as well. Today, we jump into a bunch of big news that's really going on, um, specifically in the Bitcoin space regarding China shutting down the miners, what that's done to the network, what that's done to the hash rate, and ultimately done to the price action and what we should expect in the short term, as well as the long term from that we dive into nation states like El Salvador, adopting it, bringing it into over 6 million people, and what that means again, in the short term on the price action, as well as the long term. We dive into the lending markets, how they work, um, why the prices are swinging wildly on that, and then what we should expect on that. And also we get into some strategies that even people like you and I, retail investors, could use if we want to try to increase the amount of our investment. So there's so much good information that we jumped in today with Charles. Um, highly recommend this. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Market Disruptor Show. And today I'm joined by Charles Edwards. He's the founder of Caprioli Investments. Um, he has some great insights into the market, some, some stuff that's very, very relevant. I'm excited to dig into. So Charles, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Mark. So uh, I've been following your work for quite a while and uh, the insights that you have into kind of the markets and what's going on uh, from the bigger picture are, are very good. And so I want to dig into that, have you on today. Um, but for those that aren't that aware of who you are and what you're doing, why don't you just give us a little bit of background on, on what you have going on right now? Yeah, sure. So I'm the founder of Capital Investments and we're a, a licensed asset manager in the crypto space and primarily concerned with um, managing crypto and Bitcoin in the long run and outperforming in the long run. And we use autonomous algorithms to trade 24 seven and take long, short and cash positions. Um, and more recently this year, we, we launched our, our fund for accredited and professional investors. So that's basically what consumes my time these days. Yeah, um, that's, that's awesome how you're doing that. It's been great to keep up with what you're doing. Now, um, I see you um, talking a lot about um, news-based events, um, but at the same time, you're kind of a, a trader, right? You're using these algorithms to trade off mm -hmm. of. So how do you use those two in conjunction? I mean, do you just let the kind of algorithms kind of do what they do based off of the patterns on the charts, or do you uh, affect those algorithms based off of what you're seeing out in the market and the news? Yeah, good question. So I like to say it's 95% autonomous, right? So wherever possible, we let the algorithms do its thing. And, and, and often you might see me tweeting or, or saying things about direction. And that's my opinion. And, and my opinion will change frequently with the data as well, but it doesn't necessarily drive the investment or trading strategy. That said, there, there can be outlier events, right? Um, and there can be things which haven't happened before or um, just which are outside of normal sort of historical conditions. So um yeah great example is like more recently when elon does a tweet right and and we saw particularly in may he do a tweet and the price had moved up to 10 percent in the direction of yeah, for or against depending on his yeah. mood <laughs> yeah um so there's things like that and there's also you know the china macro situation so what what our trading system will um it, when there's high volatility in the market will will call us and we'll we'll assess it and make a decision if we want to do a bit of an overlay or a reduction in exposure. Um, we try not to do that wherever possible, but sometimes we will. So we might reduce position sizing, for example, or or um, or yeah, manage that accordingly with where we think the market picture is. But broadly, it's ninety five percent just going with the the algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Um, it seems that though, like uh, even though these these one off events happen, um, you know, with Elon tweeting or for example, uh, but sometimes the charts almost move like in conjunction with that in a sense where they have their different levels, say Fibonacci retracement levels, and they're kind of like off psychological triggers. And almost yeah. sometimes it's like the charts almost just seem to match up with the, the news somehow. Yeah. That, that is always fascinating. I suppose that that's the technical analyst argument of everything's in the price. Um, and yeah, it, the, the Fibonacci levels in particular and, and, and certain daily and weekly supports, it's, it's, it's really, it is amazing. As you say, that you see, the the reality of the world actually just line up with with simple um, levels on charts. Yeah. 
Hey guys, let me just interrupt this interview real quick just to plug the show sponsor, and that is BlockFi. Now, BlockFi is doing amazing things in the Bitcoin finance space. As a matter of fact, they've cracked some really big news by bringing on the ex-CFTC um, chair, Chris Giancarlo, um, and they are one of the most transparent, most heavily regulated um, companies inside the United States, which gives me a lot of trust um, into what their services are. Now, I've recently did a video talking about how to retire off of Bitcoin. And you can do that by leveraging debt and interest against Bitcoin. And BlockFi is the the number one company in the United States or maybe in the world to go to and use. Um, they are leading the charge. They're paying interest on your Bitcoin if you park it with them, or you can borrow against it. Now, as I broke down in that video, you can borrow against your Bitcoin. And when you take debt against it, it's not taxable. It's not a taxable event. You can use that debt for anything that you want, including to live off of, to leverage up and buy more, or roll it into another asset. Um, you can do something like I've done recently, like sell some real estate, put that money into Bitcoin, now, as that Bitcoin price has risen, I'm able to borrow against it and go back and buy the same real estate or something similar. And I still own the Bitcoin and I also own the new asset as well. Lots of ways you can do this. Um, and BlockFi is the company that I recommend. Down in the description, I have a link that you can click on. If you choose to use that link, you can earn up to $250 in Bitcoin just for using that link. So check out BlockFi now. Yeah. So if we uh, if we dig into some more of the news-based stuff that you're talking about, um, I know you've been uh, putting out quite a bit of content on that. I think you have a new newsletter that actually kind of focused on it. But it seems like the big thing that's driving the market right now is, is China. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I did a video uh, maybe a couple months ago, and I was kind of showing like all the times China has uh, banned uh, Bitcoin. Yes, <laughs> and yeah. I think it was, I, I forget now, seven, eight times or whatever, you know, where they've come out and banned it. Um, and it seems like it's been maybe losing relevance, but this one was like really, really the big one. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they banned mining in China. Yeah. And so that's, you know, been a huge disruption for the network. Um, I know it's something that you've really been focused on. What are your thoughts on, on China getting out of the mining situation? Yeah, that was a, that was a really interesting scenario we've been going through the last you know two months i suppose um as you say it seems to be almost every six or 12 months there's a china ban and you know basically it has zero impact because historically until more recently you know the last couple of months china represented 65 percent of of global mining for bitcoin and a significant portion of trading so there's a heavy concentration in china um so when when this announcement of the ban came out it was it was con it was more concerning than normal probably because it came from high levels of government but there was always that it was a big question mark you know will this be enforced or maybe it will take three or six months or a year in, in which case the impact would probably be less but it was enforced very rapidly and we saw as soon as individual provinces like um enforce that ban for the government within 12 to 24 hours just hash rate dropped 20 to 30 percent almost instantaneously it was just shut down right um so huge stress in the network. The security of the network has gone down. You can argue comparably with the hash rate. I would say the intrinsic value has gone down as well, comparably with the hash rate um, based on energy value. Um, and there's good and bad from that. You know, the, the good possible arguable good argument is that in the long term, there'll be more decentralization. In the short term, I think it does have a big impact on value and security. Um, and and, and the, 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 the shorter term positive of that is that because it was, in, it was um, affected so fast, we've kind of already seen 80 to 90% of that outcome play out. So there's not much worse the situation we get from a China perspective. I think, you know, may give or take 10% more hash rate reduction on an average sort of level. But, you know, they banned it for, you know, in banking as well. So pretty much the worst case scenario happened and it's, and it's done. That doesn't mean the price impact is done, but in terms of the network impact, it's, it's pretty much done, which is, which is great that assuming other conditions can hold, we can kind of grow from here, I think, in terms of the network anyway. Yeah, it seems like uh, there's a couple of things to dig into on that, but it seems that, you know, one of the biggest pieces of, uh, of uh, pushback from no coiners or people that don't really understand Bitcoin would always say that, uh, yeah, but China controls the network. Mm. Uh, right. They have the majority of the mining and they, they don't understand how that works. And so um, it takes that objection away. Now, China doesn't control the mining. So from that perspective, you would think it'd be good. In addition, um, it shows uh, how little control one nation or wh whoever has control of the mining has, but also um, shows how resilient the network is, because, I mean, imagine 
any other type of company or any type of business trying to relocate and reallocate resources. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, it seemed to kind of going pretty good. It's doing what it's doing. So it seems like it's a net win to me, but you're saying maybe not totally. I, I think in two to four years, it, it's probably a net win. Probably the impact is negligible. I think in yeah. the, you know, the immediate timeframes in the next six months, it's questionable. Um, I think as of now, it's had a big impact and it remains to be seen how that recovery goes. I think the scene is set for a good recovery. Um, why I say that is normally when you have a what I call a minor capitulation or, or big drops in hash rate, normally that would happen when prices, you know, you've, you've seen the bubble, we've had a blow off the top, and yep. then price starts approaching what the average cost for mining is, and that's when miners start to lose profitability and the less efficient ones have to either shut down or sell or they go out of business or what have you, and you kind of get this cascading reinforcement downwards. Um, we, we don't have that now in, in terms of the broader network because price is around 30000 Energy value production cost is, you know, 20000 or lower. So there's a, a high margin still on the market for mining. It's a very profitable business. So the other miners broadly now are not struggling. So that's great news um, in that there's no reason for immediate sell pressure from them. Uh, but that obviously hinges on us staying above the sort of 30, 32 level. Any, you know, considerable time near the low, tw low to mid-20s could raise that possible for a further cascade down but i see that as relatively low risk at the moment anyway and, and as you say it's 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 more or less but it's more or less played out in china so that and and people are already setting up in you know kazakhstan and the us new mining operations so there's the scene is set for more growth pending on the network broadly remaining healthy i suppose yeah i mean it, it definitely you mentioned already like it, it drops the security of the network mm -hmm. um so if there was ever going to be a time to attack the network it seems like now would be the right time yes <laughs> yeah, you can argue that. I, you know, I haven't done the, the study, but this, the hash rate is still incredibly high. So the chances of that happening are very low, but there's, yeah, you could maybe make the case that uh, the network, it has had the biggest drop, right, in, in its security ever as a, on a relative portion. So it is, it's a shock to the network, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you had talked about when the hash rate drops down um, uh, about about the cost of Bitcoin or the value of Bitcoin potentially dropping with that hash rate as if yeah. the hash rate is like a floor for the price. Um, because I'm guessing uh, the way you're seeing it is the, 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 it sets a floor, meaning the cost of production is up. So then they have to sell for profit over that. And so if the cost of production goes down, then potentially the price could move down. Is that kind of the way you're looking at it? Yeah, there's a, a couple of elements. So first one production cost is, based on the energy spent to, to produce the hash rates that we can observe pretty readily um, and the energy spent to support the network. And you can then work out based on the average cost of electricity, based on different studies that have been done on different on, on miners in different locations, how much they're spending on that. And then you can work out how much they're making from mining Bitcoin. And what you find is when they when they equate, when the, the actual price equals the production costs, um, then or electrical costs in this case the raw cost of running the network the basic electrical input you you very rarely see price spend any time below that i think it, it touched into it briefly in march last year um but it's more or less a price floor so it's a great buying opportunity when price gets down there now it's 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 below twenty thousand at the moment so that's quite a way away but when when i talk about the the hash rate dropping and, and the value dropping I'm, I'm referring a bit more towards the energy value, which is another sort of piece of work I did, which basically just it's it's the evaluation, what I would say, the evaluation of Bitcoin based on the energy input in. And there's no formula fitting. There's no, um, you know, power laws or, or square roots or funny numbers or anything. All it is is the raw joules of energy into the network right. times by one simple integer, right? Like to get the, the to basically to convert joules to dollars. And you find that it maps price very well and price mean reverts to it a lot of critics say you know hash rate follows price um and that therefore it's invalid i think there is that happens like the like hash rate definitely does flow price if price is going up more people are going to mine to make more money but it does go both ways you, you do see that when uh, miners struggle it can preempt price drops and it does and big cases of that 2018 um and there's been a number of more recent cases but probably the best um support for that is the hash ribbon buy signal which has happened 
uh, 12 or 13 times now in Bitcoin's lifespan, roughly once a year. And it's, I, I wouldn't say the best buy signal with 100% hit rate to date um, for Bitcoin. So, and that's based on hash rate and, and then followed by some, some price appreciation. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's kind of how I think about it. And then when you see the network, and you can also just think about it about security, right? A lot of the intrinsic value of Bitcoin is security. If the security doesn't work, it's worth nothing. So when that goes down, I argue the, the value goes down too. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. So yeah, it is kind of supply and demand and then you have the difficulty adjustment as well. So then that kind of changes. So right now there's a nice premium for mining Bitcoin because so many miners were shut off, but when we adjust the difficulty uh, here in just a short couple of weeks, um, then that will affect the price as well, mm -hmm. which then maybe pushes that signal back up. Yes. Yeah, so there's some interesting, well, there's, there's, it's correlated, right? The hash rate impacts difficulty. And, and vice versa. So there's also, if you look at big changes in difficulty, we're going to have, I think, one of, if not the biggest uh, change soon. Yeah. Often that happens again at a local price bottom. And, and often we do have, um, as, as a, you know, the hash driven buy signal, you get the best buy signals during the capitulation. And we're in the capitulation now. The trouble is that just based on that metric alone, there's a ton of volatility up and down in those periods, as we've seen in the last um, four or five weeks. But it, it usually is a, a you know, media, a midterm um, opportunity for, for getting a long position, basically. <laughs> okay. So while we have that um, disrupting the network and potentially kind of creating this FUD and this downward pressure, which uh, when, it's, when the dust settles, is probably a good long-term thing. Um, at the same time, we also have some positive things that are going on that we kind of have to balance out as well, right? So it uh, seems like one of the big ones is the whole El Salvador piece, which I know you've kind of mentioned as well a little bit. Um, and uh, as one nation gets out of it, um, another one jumps into it. Um, and so we're seeing El Salvador kind of adopt that as, a, as, an, as an asset. And now we're seeing several other countries um, starting to jump in as well. So how do you offset that good news, I guess, with, uh, I mean, there's yeah. massive demand there. Yeah, so you, you got to consider the weight of the evidence, right? Everything and, and, and add it together. Um, El Salvador is great news. So that's, you know, it's, it's this, the long-term vision of Bitcoin solely playing out and starting in the smaller company, countries like El Salvador. And, and also this year we're seeing gradual um, institutional and, and company adoption and fund adoption of, of Bitcoin, which is great. I, I thought there would be more probably in the last few months. So we, the big ones obviously Tesla and then Michael Saylor, but then we didn't really see some of the more big names we thought might have happened by now, which probably didn't contribute, you know, can, kind of contributed to Bitcoin probably stagnating a bit in those months. But broadly, it's going the right direction. And I think a lot will depend on how that plays out from here. If we see, you know, Paraguay or other countries adding it as legal tender in the next weeks and months, and maybe, you know, more funds like last week, there's a $2.2 billion um, crypto fund announced. So the more this stuff happens, the, the the better it is for the the for the for the short to midterm for Bitcoin. So where where I kind of I see lots of pros and cons. So you can probably tell that I have a bit of uncertainty where things are now. And I've written in the newsletter that there's a range between thirty two and forty thousand uh, from a sort of technical point of view, which we're in, which is kind of like no man's land. And it will really be interesting to see if and when we do break out of that range to either side, what the fundamental picture is. So. If you look at just the Bitcoin long-term sort of cyclical metrics, you could definitely argue the cycle top is in. I would say if you look at the ones that really matter, it's probably 60% just based on Bitcoin history, the top is in and we're now in a bear market. But there's also a lot of metrics right now which are really oversold. Um, things like, you know, the hash room is one indicator, the Maya multiple was 0.7. Um, there's an argument for the Wickoff accumulation right now, and, and also the, the the Bitcoin futures sentiment. The market is heavily short, or, or there's a more of a skew to the short side, which often means we're near a bottom. So I think locally there's a there's a bottom, midterm slightly higher probability of the top being in. That said, it will really matter when what the most important time will be when we break out what the conditions are. So if we go to 40 or 45,000 and then everyone's like, yeah, buy the dip, bull market's on and, and you know, the open interest and leverage goes through the roof again and everyone's long, then I'll probably be like, okay, the top is in. <laughs> right. um, it depends on the conditions then, right? If we get there and it's the opposite and people are like, oh no, this is the uh, the dead cat bounce and 
and the market shorting and um, and and other metrics like network value undervalued, and 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 the picture looks better, then it, then we could definitely see great continuation. So I I kind of more focus on that shorter term sort of weekly to monthly level. Um, if you're looking, you know, multi years out, I think you know Bitcoin's in a great shape and things are going in the right direction. Mm, yeah, so that's a that's a really good point to bring up. It's really about your perspective on it, right? Yeah. So and and the time frame that you're looking at. So if you're not actively trying to trade it and you you're going to hold it for two three years, then now is probably a good time as opposed to trying to play um, these ranges. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I've, I've been a real estate investor for 25 years and, um, you know, typically you would tell someone that wants to buy a house, at least in the United States, um, you know, don't buy a house unless you plan to hold it for at least like five years because you yeah. kind of have that, that real estate cycle. And I think we've seen in, in, in Bitcoin, we haven't ever seen um, a dip more than three years. So you kind of yes. have like that same thing. So if you have that longer term view than uh, a couple of years, then it's always probably a pretty good time to buy. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would say and that's probably that the most applicable horizon to most people investing in in crypto right and and i would say can you tell me a better <laughs> investment option over a five-year horizon i think you'd struggle to find one so yeah um, yeah i completely agree with that now um when we saw the price action really uh, really jumping you know over the last 12 months 12 14 months um we saw, as you said, you know, we saw like the micro strategies jumping in and um, maybe we didn't see as many people jumping in as, as, uh, as maybe really did. Maybe we, the announcements didn't come, but we did see some big ones. We saw, you know, mass mutual insurance company coming in and we've seen several big hedge fund investors jumping in and um, other funds. I mean, so we've seen, seen a quite a bit of movement. Uh, maybe we don't know about everything, but um, as that was going up, of course, the price was kind of going up exponential. And I wanted to jump in and talk about like the, the lending and borrowing markets. Yeah. And so um, the lending borrowing market seemed to like really kind of get stretched for a while where um, they were paying really big premiums. Like some of these companies, the BlockFi's and, and whatnot were paying really big premiums. Um, but now that started to go back down. And um, that seems to me sort of like a supply and demand type metric, right? Like, well, there's not as much demand for the borrowing anymore. And so those, those rates have been coming down. What's been going on on that, that side of the market? Yeah, that you've, you've kind of said it. So as the bull market was really playing out from say, you know, you can choose many time frames, say September last year to sort of March this year, April this year, we saw, you know, everyone wanted to buy Bitcoin and crypto and everything was was pumping. And, and what happens then is a, the, a lot of the core unique contracts to Bitcoin to get leverage and more exposure, like the perpetual swap contracts allow you to take on incredible leverage and up to an over hundred X of your capital. And some studies by Binance, for example, found that 80% of traders use over 20x leverage. Now, wow. those traders don't actually account for 80% of the volume, right? It's a smaller portion, but it still shows you that any drop of 5% or more will liquidate them and then there's market sell pressure. So we're seeing more and more people take long positions and, and, and long open interest grow. And, and in those contracts, the long positions have to pay um, the short positions of funding rate, basically, to hold their exposure. And that's why we got really high funding rates and a great opportunity to get risk-free um, return on, on, on dollars, for example, of up to and over 30 to 50% on an annualized basis for Bitcoin. So that was, that was really a great opportunity for the first few months of the year. With this big collapse of 50% in the last five, six weeks, we saw that reverse. So now it's the opposite and those rates are really drop down, which is health. It's actually healthy um, in terms of the, the growth for opportunity for Bitcoin. It means that there's, you know, that those people who are only buying basically have slowed down and it started to reverse, um, you know, because at some point if everyone's buying and you know, all your neighbors are buying and your friends are buying and the news is talking about Bitcoin every day and there's eventually you reach a point where there's no more buyers left yeah. and prices to revert. So we kind of got to that point, I suppose, in, in hindsight and that the margins of that, those contracts are definitely reduced and I'm sure there'll be other opportunities in the future when extremities happen either to the up or downside where they return. But at the moment, it's more or less, you know, the, the opportunity there is more or less gone for the time. Yeah. Being. So, so explain to uh, everybody exactly uh, or, or a little bit better how that works. So um, you're using exchange or you can have leverage. Um, and so you're going to go whatever 20 X uh, long. So I enter that 20x long, but in order to do that, the exchange then has to fulfill the um, shorts to cover that while I hold that open. So then they're borrowing in one of these other markets. Um, I don't do that, obviously, right? I'm doing it with the exchange. They're kind of handling that for me. 
Hey, sorry to interrupt this video just one more time. I'm not running Google ads, so it's actually way less interruption than I normally would have on a video. Um, and that's because it's sponsored by BlockFi. Um, they are opening up the world of Bitcoin and financial products, offering to pay you interest on your Bitcoin, um, better than owning a rental property that you have to manage and control and have the risks. You can just earn interest on it or you can leverage against it. Now, I plan to hold my Bitcoin forever and literally never sell my Bitcoin. So how do you do that? Well, if I need money, I don't want to sell that Bitcoin. I'm going to pay tax on it. All right, I'm going to end up with less and I don't have the Bitcoin anymore. So a better way to do it is to borrow against the Bitcoin. So I've put all my money into Bitcoin. If I want to buy a car or I want to buy a house, I can borrow against it at very, very low competitive rates, get my house, get my car, whatever that may be, and get to keep the Bitcoin. Now, I've done a whole video on this. Uh, you can find it. I'll link it down in the description below how to retire off of Bitcoin without paying taxes. And you can do that with BlockFi services. Um, I'll, I'll link to the video down below. I'm also going to put a link to BlockFi. BlockFi, if you choose to click on that link to check them out, you can earn up to $250 in free Bitcoin just for using that link. And that's it. Let's go ahead and get back to the interview. Yeah, it's, exactly. So they, they just automatically deduct this funding rate normally every eight hours. And there's a basis rate of 0.01, roughly is 10 to 12% a year you have to pay to hold that position because you're effectively borrowing capital, right, to, to take your leverage trade. Um, but so they're borrowing like, at so they're be, they'd be borrowing at twelve percent whatever, and then um, I might if I had put my money at one of these um, lending companies, then I might make eight percent, and then they're making the spread on that. Yeah, so if you want to do the if you want to do the trade to make the risk free opportunity, you would you would for example if you had ten bitcoin, um, you could one x short those bitcoin and you'd get paid the funny rate because the longs pay the shorts. If, if the funding rate is positive, but it, it varies over time. So right now it's, yeah, negative to zero region at the moment. Right. Well, I guess that's uh, if, if they were going long and I wanted to go short against that, then that would kind of offset that. I was, I was kind of asking more about like these lending markets, right? So there's a couple of companies I seen you, you know, tweet about Nexo, um, oh, BlockFi, yeah. Celsius, et cetera. Right. And so they kind of, they, do they kind of facilitate those types of trades for the exchanges or that's more for like funds like you? Yeah, so I'm not sure of their arrangement with the exchanges and in and, and, and how that works. When I've spoken about those sort of companies, BlockFi, for example, in the past, it's more about the opportunity to, to put your, say you've got Bitcoin, you want to keep your Bitcoin exposure, you might put your Bitcoin on a platform like that, and then they will give you collateral to take out a loan. So you can then say you've got uh, 10 Bitcoin or something, you might take out five Bitcoin worth of, of, of dollars. So, you know, just to make the numbers easy, say it's $50,000 you take out, then you can go and buy Bitcoin and short it. So you cancel out the position, you still net US dollars and earn the funding rate. And that's what you could have done earlier in the year, but the opportunity now is for the time being is gone. You know, it could, in a week or two, it could be back, but right now there's not a lot of opportunity there. And the opportunity is gone because the price action uh, has changed in a sense. So now uh, there's not as many people long as there used to be. Exactly. The, the open interest, so the number of open contracts got destroyed in the last two months. There was the most open interest we've ever had in, in Bitcoin. And it's down, I don't know if the number's on me, but say 50 to 60% over that period. And, and the relative portion of, of people taking long positions to shorts was extremities to the long side back then. And now it's more or less normalized to being slightly more shorts. So that's why that opportunity is more or less gone. But it's, it's when you get extremities in the market. So we, we had a num, you know, that looking back at, at prior cycle tops, we didn't have a clear top signal. I would say in the last few months, we did have extremities which were in a topping zone, but normally we'd get a lot more extension into overvaluation in prior bull runs. But when you do see things like the Mayer multiple get above you know, 1.6 and, and other things like MVRV, so market value to realized value and unrealized profit and loss get up to really high levels, that along with some of these other metrics like um, uh, the open interest shows you how extended the market is. And when the market is extended, that's when you get the best opportunities in terms of these risk-free trades. Right. And so now we're, uh, now we're, now we're stuck. So um, sometimes I guess it goes from the long and then maybe everyone piles in the shorts and then you would reverse, just reverse that same trade. Yeah. 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 That, that in theory is possible. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, so anybody looking to take those opportunities and you have to wait till we get into a, a screaming bull market again. <laughs> yeah. I, there, there's definitely still some options out there, more, you know, complex, you know, involving options and things, but the, that one was like, it was, it was so easy. It was literally a couple of, you make a couple of transactions and you're done and you lock in that interest rate. And that one now is more or less subsided. I, I'm sure we'll be back again, but yeah, for now. <laughs> yeah. Basically, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it seemed uh, I was hearing a lot about that. And then, of course, obviously, things slowed down um, when you see. Uh, but when you see uh, I know you mentioned earlier before, like uh, micro strategy and what they've done and like they've been continuing to build um, or I should say borrow money to continue to go long. And it seems like even just the one they just did recently, even with the price depressed as it was still oversubscribed. I mean, that shows a ton of um, seems like a ton of interest. And uh, that's almost like a levered way to play the long, isn't it? Yes, yeah, that and that was a that was a good result that it was oversubscribed. I was a bit worried uh, before we got the announcement how it would go, given where the yeah. market was at. But you're right; it shows that there's still some solid institutional interest in the market, which is really positive. But yeah, yeah it, 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 for market strategy, definitely, it's that leveraging factor. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, would that be comparable to the average retail trader? Um, either either one borrowing against his money with BlockFi, or even using like a home equity line or something to like lever up. Well, yeah, there's just, there's the argument that the you, the retail traders can be easily liquidated by the exchanges if there's a price movement and they're highly leveraged. Whereas you could argue, and you know, there's cases both ways for this that Michael Saylor can't be, <laughs> given his control over the company and, and vision. Um, that you know, that would be interesting to see what happens if we did see price back down around the twenty thousands. Um, how how that would really play out? But I think it's less, much less risky in terms of. Um, you know the, the leverage impact that could have. Where I see it as as possibly risky. I made a tweet the other day that you know subsequent um, uh, might the sailor tweets that they're buying more is not really a good thing at the moment because uh, if he's the only institution buying, it's 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 great that it shows institutional buying and when it oversubscribes, that's good. But you want to see more institutions buying, not just the one sort of player for concentration risk, but also just as, just as broader economic interest in Bitcoin and evidence of that growing over time. So, you know, any announcement from another S&P 100 company or something like that in the coming months would be incredibly, I would say, bullish. Um, but well, we did have a country. Yeah, we did have a, a country. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was positive. <laughs> we, did, we did have a country. So that, that one's pretty yeah. big. And then we have yeah. uh, Nidig announcing that they're going to bring on 300 million checking accounts to buy, sell and store Bitcoin. Um, by the end of the year. So, I mean, that's, yes. uh, so, so the, the news has continued to pile on. Yes. And then I, th you know, it, when you look back at 2017, 18, early 18, I think right now the given the damage that's been done to the price and the network, at least the announcements we have are probably more positive than we had back then. We didn't really have a lot, I think yeah. happening in sort of March, April's of 2018. So it is, it's definitely positive and, um, yeah, it, we're kind of in this no man's land now where there's a good arguments for that we overextended and there's definitely locally, I would say, um, bullish and, you know, sort of bottoming scenario here. And it will really depend what happens when we get any kind of break out of that and where the fundamentals sit. And if we have countries or companies making announcements, I think that will really impact the next six months or so. Yeah. Uh, uh, on a little bit of uh, opinion based like speculation, I mean, back to the kind of micro strategy thing um, you had mentioned, you know, if the price drops down to 20,000, we'll see how he handles that. Um, I think their average is what somewhere 26,000 or something like yeah. that right now. So if it dropped down to 20,000, then it's below their, below their average, but the way that it's set up, I mean, it's all based off of borrowed right or debt. So as long as he can continue to service the debt, it shouldn't really pose any risk. And they're throwing off what 30 million of free cash flow per year. So Yes. Uh, they, they borrowed it almost near zero. So it seems like uh, covering that debt for an extended period of time shouldn't probably be that big of a problem. Yeah, I think structurally, it's it's probably one of the safest um, holdings in that regard and, 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 and given his control of the company. The, the question is, you know, how will people and him react if there was major losses in that position? Um, I... I think if we did get down to that region, at least in the near term, say 20,000 or something, it's not going to be for long. It'll probably be maybe a day or something like that. In, so back up the year. truck. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think that would be a great buying opportunity. 
Um, but it, it remains to be seen, right? We don't know how, like, if if situation turns more negative or or, or we did go into an extended 80, 90% down draw bear market, then, you know, who knows how he would he would hold up in a, in that scenario with it, you know, hasn't been seen yet. Um, but, yeah, generally speaking, I think it, it's relatively safe from, you know, probability, putting all the probabilities together of, of what he might do. I think he's... He's made pretty pretty clear his uh, intention to hold, but he did in more recent announcements say that they could sell some. So there is that uh, possibility of selling action on their side. Yeah. All right. Um, well, like I said, we'll, 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 the, the time will tell, I suppose. Um, if you want to tell us a little bit about your fund, I think that'd be pretty interesting to dig into a little bit. So I know you have this fund. You've had it going for a couple of years. We've kind of already touched on some of the things that you're doing, um, but uh, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so uh, the fund itself just launched this year in March. Um, but yeah, our investment strategy and our and as a licensed asset manager and managing capital, we've been doing that for almost two years. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, start long short algorithmic strategy, primarily Bitcoin, um, with the intent of outperforming Bitcoin in the long run. And you know, to date, full quarters to date over the last seven quarters, we have achieved that every quarter. Um, you know, the last couple of months definitely has been intense, and we haven't you know, done as well as would have liked, you know, got on the wrong side of some, some um, positions, I suppose, but that that's, it, you know, never, it's never enjoyable to go through, but that's part of the game where you're, you're investing in the most volatile asset in, uh, you know, the asset class in the world. Yeah. Um, there you do get these periods of our underperformance, but we, we, as long as we're achieving our goal in the long run of outperforming, then we're, we're happy and we have been doing that so far. And is that outperforming uh, annually? Or uh, what, what, what's your what's your uh, goal? Uh, outperforming quarterly, annually? Yeah, quarterly to annually. So we we've done it today quarterly, um, and yeah, we just overextend. You know, quarterly, six monthly, that sort of time horizon. We want to you know be on the right side of it. Yeah, and so uh, who do you primarily work work with, or who are you looking for? Uh, well, we we can only yeah we we. we our investors are either accredited or professional investors. So you have to meet a certain number of criteria to, to come on board. But yeah, we're open to, to those, those sort of people globally. And, and is this a, a Bitcoin investment or a cash investment or either way? It doesn't matter. Either way, yeah. Yeah. But somebody who probably believes in Bitcoin and wants to, wants to go along with it probably makes a little bit better sense, I would imagine. Yeah, it's a bit of a, a mixture of interest there, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a really good recap on uh, on where we're at in the market. It's interesting to uh, hear how much you're into these fundamentals, but yet at the same time driving the fund on the uh, on the signals. But um, it is interesting how they line up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make sure we link to uh, your fund and uh, your Twitter account. Is there anywhere that uh, you want to direct people? I know you write like a newsletter, like anything like that. Yeah, that's the mate. You, you've just said it. So i most active on Twitter and our website, caprioli.com, and we write a monthly newsletter. So most recently, it's talking about China and, and that impact. Yeah, awesome. All right, Charles. Well, with that, I guess we'll go ahead and sign it off. We'll make sure to link all that stuff down in the show notes before, uh, down below. And then uh, with that, thanks for joining us today. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here. All right, thanks. See ya.